Hello and welcome. I'm Morag Gamble and you're tuning in to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast. It's my delight to welcome Rupert Reid to the show, public scholar and climate activist. He's based in England, but I spoke to him in France where he was leading a residency on eco-spirituality and the moderate flank, something you'll hear more about. Rupert is well known as a former spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion. He's an associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia and the author of over a dozen books, currently working on one with the Permaculture magazine about transformative adaptation. He's also written for The Guardian, The Independent, The Ecologist, Permaculture magazine and many more, and a frequent guest too on BBC Radio. He was part of the group that catalyzed the British government's declaration of a climate and ecological emergency and a reviewer of the recent IPCC report, one he describes as the scariest yet. We talked about transformative adaptation, also the great turning and how we can turn faster and taking action versus being an activist and also talked about his concept of throughtopia, stories that can help us through the changes and disruptions that are our new normal and the kinds of messages that shine through the fear, despair and overwhelm. Rupert says our world needs positive and radical change quickly. Civilization as we know it is over, but collapse is not inevitable. We need a new way of thinking about politics, about philosophy, about our role in the world, something like a permaculture rebellion of practivism myceliating rapidly everywhere. And for the Australian listeners, he offers some encouragement for voters in our coming federal election. So this show, The Sense Making in a Changing World, is hosted and sponsored by my organisation, the Permaculture Education Institute, and our globally recognised Permaculture Educators Program. Before we begin, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the unceded lands from which I'm speaking with you, the Gabi Gabi, and pay my deep respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to recognise their deep care for this land, the waters, air and biodiversity. So let's dive in. Please make sure to check out the show notes for links to Rupert's work and all the things that we talk about, and also for more information about our work here at the Permaculture Education Institute. Oh, and please make sure to subscribe so you get notifications of all our new podcast episodes. Please leave us a lovely review. It does help the bots find our little podcast. And finally, I'd love for you to share this with a friend or a group and to myceliate the ideas and open conversations for positive practical change. Well, thanks so much for joining me on the Sense Making the Changing World show, Rupert. It's a real delight to have you here. Uh, You're so well known as a spokesperson for action on climate. And uh, some of the things that I'd like to explore with you today are really looking about, well, where to from here? You know, you were one of the reviewers on the latest IPCC report and, you know, one of the direst reports that we've had yet Um, But just because of everything that's going on in the world, we're not really hearing very much about it. You talk about how, you know, this civilization that we're currently in has has come to an end. Um, What's what's next? Um, I Mm. do like what you say, though. There was something that I was looking at. You said we are in a civilizational emergency, but collapse is not inevitable. Could you Mm -hmm. maybe just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, thanks, Morag, and yeah, great to talk with you about these literally vital topics. So the way I see it, and I lay this out in my little book, uh, This Civilization is uh, is Finished, uh, where I collaborated with the uh, Australasian uh, degrowth expert, uh, Samuel Alexander. The way I see it is that this civilization is without doubt coming to an end, but there remains an open question as to how it ends. It doesn't have to end in collapse. If we're determined enough and bold enough and fortunate enough, then there is still a possibility of a change by way of transformation uh, rather than merely by collapse. And that's at the heart of the, the way that I've been pushing the concept of transformative adaptation in recent years, and I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Basically, uh, if we're going to avert uh, collapse, we do have to do something extraordinary uh, and rapid, and we have to be rigorously honest about where we are, because if we're not rigorously honest, then 
we're not going to actually be serious uh, enough and determined enough. So in terms of the IPCC reports, the very latest report says we need deep and immediate cuts if we are to stay within the 1.5 safe zone. Uh, by immediate, they mean starting now. I mean, this year, that they're explicit about that. Um, that is not going to happen. That's not going to happen on a worldwide basis. It's not going to happen in places like Australia. It's not going to happen in Russia, Saudi Arabia, Brazil. It's not even going to happen in the USA and the UK, which have both said in, in the wake of the Ukraine conflict, they both absolutely stupidly said they're going to go for more fossil fuels, which is crazy. It's exactly what Putin wants. He wants us to be dependent on the international fossil fuel nexus. What he doesn't want is for us to start start. Uh, being serious about energy efficiency. What he doesn't want is for us to have local, accessible community, wind and solar and so forth. So anyway, that's all by way of saying that the political system is continuing to fail us really, really badly. And as a result, tragically, we have to let go of the idea of staying within 1.5 degrees, staying within the safe zone. Mm. Now, this should be a cause for for outrage and much greater action. And that's what I'm seeking to, to leverage. So the possibility of civilizational transformation without collapse is dependent on a lot more people stepping up and stepping up soon in order to take, take such action. And such action, such action needs to occur uh, on all levels. So it means political action. We'll probably have a word about your imminent election uh, in a moment. Uh, it means nonviolent direct action. Definitely, it means conventional activism. We need to have a lot more activism. But, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this as well, it means more than just conventional activism and the so-called radical flank. Uh, it means millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people ultimately stepping up and engaging in action in the spheres where they have other kinds of power. So I'm talking about action by businesses. I'm talking about people taking action in workplaces. I'm talking about people taking action in their geographic communities. And of course, that's where permaculture becomes most crucial. And this kind of action, this new agenda for mass action on climate and ecology, which is what we need in the wake of terrible, terrible political failure. This is what I call the moderate flank. This is the, the need for, and it's starting to happen, an emergence at scale of people stepping up to take positive action as well as protest where the powers that be have failed us. Mm. You know, you, you also talk about the great turning and mm. this is something that I've, you know, that I feel the permaculture movement has been working on for a long time, you know, working Absolutely. on eco-villages and, and regenerative farming and um, cooperatives and, like, from, from the social permaculture to the landscape permaculture to, um, you know, all the different scales. But there's something about this great turning that is not turning fast enough. So yes. what are the kinds of things? I mean, you've been working from, you know, from academia to politics to activism. What are the kinds of messages that you see shine through, you know, mm. shine through the the kind of the the despair, shine through the the rage, shine through the the apathy to actually catalyze this mass action that you're talking about? Because this is something that I struggle with on a daily basis, trying to work out what how is it that we communicate or demonstrate or myceliate this at a scale yeah. that is what we need? Well, what a great question. Thank you for that question. So let me start out by saying, yeah, absolutely. Of course, one of the reasons we're having this conversation is that permaculture has been leading in this space for a long time. And that's why I chose to work with the Permaculture magazine, with Maddie Harland and others, to have this series, which we've been having, of, uh, of articles on transformative adaptation. So I think I should say a little bit more about what transformative adaptation is at this moment, because really transformative adaptation is an attempt to frame where we're at and where we need to be in terms of this uh, historic unprecedented crisis that we're in. If we think about it in terms of 
the climate movement and efforts to make progress on climate. That movement, and when I say movement, I mean activism, but also I mean the kinds of stuff that governments have been trying to do, uh, insofar as they've been trying to do anything. Uh, that movement uh, has tended to focus until very recently on what's called mitigation, which is the technical term for greenhouse gas emissions uh, reductions. Uh, and why has that been? Well, that's a long conversation, but in my view, the, the, the single biggest reason why that has been is because people have not been willing to face up to the fact that, for example, we are going to miss the 1.5 uh, target. We are not going to, we are not, or we are already not in a safe world uh, climate wise, but it's going to become progressively unsafer for quite a long time to come. And when you talk about adaptation, when you get serious on adaptation and, and not just the kind of defensive adaptation that the Australian government, for example, has majored on, not just, you know, building higher seawalls and higher flood defences and so on, which is just an attempt to keep the existing failed system staggering on a little bit longer and actually is therefore harmful and fragilizing. When you start talking about real adaptation, strategic adaptation, transformative adaptation, adaptation that is willing to seek to transform our system and, and wants to try to create flourishing ways for us to be to, together rather than the same old failed civilization. When you get serious about talking about and doing transformative adaptation, then you can no longer deny that we're in serious trouble, right? As long as we carry on talking only mitigation and keep saying things like, well, it's about net zero 2050, or even it's about net zero 2035, or even it's about net zero 2030. As long as you have those conversations, basically what people continue to think is, oh, well, we've still got quite a bit of time then. Adaptation is about our vulnerability in the here and now, our vulnerability already to, well, if you think about the Australian context, because of course, uh, Australia, I mean, one of the terrible ironies of Australia's inaction on climate is that Australia stands to be royally fucked by the, am I allowed to use that word on your podcast? You just yeah. did, so that's fine. Uh, yeah, royally fucked by the, the climate um, debacle. Uh, and it's deeply tragic and deeply ironic. I mean, you just look at the those, you know, utterly horrendous wildfires that you had uh, a little while back. Uh, and there are so many other things which I don't need to bore your listeners with, which show that Australia is on the front line uh, here. Um, these things are happening now and they are going to get worse for a long time to come. We need to seek to mitigate, to prevent them, to reduce there being more of them in the future. Of course we do. But we also need to adapt because they're here now and they're going to get worse really soon. So adaptation brings it home. Adaptation means facing up to psychological reality. And most people, most of the time, still don't want to do that. And that's my verdict. That's my judgment as to why it's taken so long to get the adaptation agenda up front. So it's now painfully starting to move up front and Permaculture Magazine have been helping that process by hosting our series of articles on transformative uh, adaptation. Uh, and um, we're producing, we're going to be producing a book based on those articles, which is really exciting. That will probably be coming out uh, next year. Um, transformative adaptation basically takes the kind of agenda that is present in permaculture and in the transition network, the transition towns movement, and said and says, this agenda needs to be mainstreamed more. This agenda needs to be fed into and aligned with uh, climate action, climate activism, government action uh, on climate. And something else that it adds, and here we're sort of learning from and drawing on um, Extinction Rebellion, uh, which of course I helped to launch and which has been such a crucial part in changing the scene, you know, for permanently really in the last few years. And what transformative adaptation ends to the, adds to the party is a little bit of a stronger sense of, and you know what, if they get in the way, they, the powers that be, and stop us from doing this, well, we're going to have to do it anyway. So in other words, transformative adaptation is saying, let's be ready if and where necessary to use the kind of tools of civil disobedience, not in the kind of wonderful way that uh, XR and Stop Adani and so on have done in terms of proactively blocking stuff and protesting and demanding stuff from the government, but more by way of saying, we're gonna, where necessary, defend the positive stuff 
that we are doing. So we're going to get on and do that stuff. And if there are things that get in the way of us doing it, then we're not necessarily going to say, oh, all right, then well, we'll just go away and try something else. Mm -hmm. That's really the sort of bold part of the transformative uh, adaptation agenda. Now, just one more word in terms of your um, invocation of despair. Um, so I'm actually right now talking to you from France. I'm here leading a residency on making eco-spirituality accessible and on the moderate flank uh, as a way of doing that. Uh, and I'm drawing a lot on the, on the great work, literally great work of my teacher, Joanna Macy. Uh, and she is, a, and her work is a crucial resource in these very difficult times. This work, the work that reconnects it's called, is a way of, as you put it, shining through uh, the despair. Um, and it's not just about, because even that phrase might give the wrong impression to some people. It's not about sort of overcoming or sidelining our despair. It's about being fully present in our despair, being fully present in our grief, being fully present in our anger, and using that energy to take us in the direction we need to, to be taken in of spreading the permaculture gospel, of getting serious about transformative uh, adaptation, uh, and so much more. It's about, as Joanna herself used to put it, despair and empowerment. I had a lovely little revelation about this, uh, Morag, a few years ago when I was leading a, a course on um, philosophy presence in relation to the climate crisis. I was painting a realistic picture, as I always do, and one of the one of the students, one of the colleagues on the course said, oh, but Rupert, you know, when I hear that, I feel you know, there's a part of me that wants to despair because it's so, the situation is so overwhelming. And one of my other students piped up and with a big smile said to the group, what's wrong with despair? And I think that's just such a wonderfully provocative question. You know, we spend so much time and energy running away from our climate uh, anxiety or trying to keep our eco depression or our eco grief uh, at bay or hoping that we don't get stuck in despair. And of course, you don't want to get stuck in despair. But the question, what's wrong with despair, invites the thought, maybe there's nothing wrong with it as something which we have to encounter, as something that is honest, and as something which can energize us. What mm. I believe about these so-called negative emotions, uh, these difficult emotions that we're unable to avoid at this time if we're alive uh, and open, what I believe is that they are the source of the greatest energy that we have at this time. And that's been the secret of success of Greta Thunberg. That's been the secret of the success of Extinction Rebellion. We've tried to channel that. You look at some of you know, what we did in the media in 2019, 2020. That's very, very clear. And that will be the secret of success of the moderate flank, as I call it, of the growing potentiality of transformative adaptation. If it succeeds, it will be because people are willing to face these difficult emotions and willing to go with them and turn them to maximum effect, to do together with determination, without any willingness to be prevented, willing to do the things that need to be done uh, and to defend them where they need to be defended. I really like how you said that, doing it together. You know, it, yes. is, a, it is a together thing, isn't it? It's not something Absolutely. that we're doing individually in our own little no. thoughts. I mean, yes, we do that action at home, but it's it's in that together action where the shift can can really happen. Totally. And I also was listening to um, a conversation you were having with um, Jeremy Lent recently about deep adaptation and deep transformation, and I remember yes. him saying something like this about the despair that he feels and that that again is his energy but he finds that he's he's kind of sitting on this almost like a fence or something he was describing he keeps dipping into it and that is the fuel mm -hmm. like he feels the yes. despair yes. and I and I often feel that as well like it, it is a fuel and it's that turning of that energy and I, I wonder in terms of um would would you describe it as a a permaculture rebellion or would you describe it some some other way how could we how can we um, frame up this mass action of permaculture and how can nice. we see it roll out in that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So uh, I'm glad you heard the conversation with Jeremy. People seem to have found that a very useful uh, conversation. And, yeah, I agree with the way he put that about 
it's you don't want to get stuck permanently in uh in climate anxiety climate depression climate despair but you do want to um allow it to be present and to dip into it just as much as it is and just as much as you need the phrase permaculture rebellion that's a brilliant phrase i mean that would be another way of describing the agenda that we're trying to set out in the transformative adaptation collective so yeah i'm i'm totally i'm totally with that let's keep uh, looking for these kinds of uh, smart and energizing framings i think that's one great fantastic we're, we're trying to activate that now and i would love to talk to you more about that mm. um, so i just before we move out of the kind of the conversation of, around despair and anxiety i wonder yes. for someone like yourself you you are fully aware of all the reports you spend you know your life exploring these things how how do you personally stay in a position to be not disabled by that full level yeah. of anxiety that that you know what's going on you see it around you all the time mm. Mm. yeah it's a fair question so i've spoken about this um with jem bendel before on one of his videos and i've spoken spoken about it in the poetry of predicament podcast uh, and people may want to look those up but uh, briefly um sometimes it's very challenging and that's what i'm talking about in those podcasts mm. sometimes it's very challenging sometimes i really suffer um something that definitely helps me is the work that reconnects is doing that with other people is leading um well so i'll just give you an example of some of the exercises and rituals we've been doing here in in france uh one of the really powerful ones is called the truth mandala uh where you um together explore the sense of the truth that you have in relation to our ecological predicament and allow those negative emotions so called to uh surface it's unbelievably powerful and ultimately very energizing and creative of community uh, just last night i led the group in the um seventh generation exercise which is a way of um imagining and well really more than imagining actually kind of inhabiting a kind of conversation with people living seven generations from now really getting a sense of the reality uh of the coming future the form that that future takes is not yet determined but there will be people and beings uh, alive uh, in the future and they depend on decisions and actions that we take now uh, and we need to feel them as a kind of as a kind of presence in potential and that's what that uh, practice is designed to do um i've led people here on the more than once on the mirror walk which is a very beautiful practice of going around an eco-psychological practice of going around and looking at the um, um, nature and uh, and seeing it as a mirror of and a mirror to ourselves uh and um on friday night when the residency ends i'll be leading uh people in a practice which i got from roman krasnerik's book the group the good ancestor uh which is also it's loosely based on Uh, a Joanna Macy style practice and it basically imagines your children or your nieces and nephews um uh reflecting upon uh, your life from the vantage point of their life after you're dead um and there's a very kind of powerful way of kind of bringing home the sense of hmm, yeah it's really about posterity it's about a legacy it's about what did we do while there was still time uh so these kind of practices leading them and taking part in them is something that i find very very uh supportive there's many more things i could say in answer to your question but perhaps that's helpful as a set of kind of guidances for people if there are people out there who've been kind of listening to this who've been you know getting stuck in despair or whatever and not knowing what to do about it one set of powerful things you can do about it is these work that reconnects practices the other thing of course is to take action uh this is one of the reasons why so many people got involved in extinction rebellion um because they found it the best therapy possible um uh and i am hoping that the emerging moderate flank um the permaculture rebellion transformative uh, adaptation the growth of um, organizations like uh, climate emergency centers people trying to organize in their businesses and workplaces uh an example would be lawyers for net zero um i'm hoping that these emerging moderate flank 
developments, especially when people start to see and to feel that they all kind of join up and all kind of point in the same direction, um, that this will give people um, an energizing sense of, on the one hand, the situation is dire, we're going to miss 1.5, governments are way off the pace, in some ways we're continuing to hurtle in the wrong direction. Uh, on the other hand, there are genuine positive things which are starting to happen and are happening uh, at scale. And, the, and you know, it's very simple. The more they happen, the less bad and potentially the better uh, the future is going to be. It's really very, very simple. Mm. You know, something that I've learned a lot by working um, with the youth, so I, I helped to, to mentor the PERMA youth that's been myceliating uh -huh. across the world, and, um, and they talk about practivism. <clears throat> so it's the positive mm. practical activism. It's yeah. permaculture as a as a frame to to do everyday activism in the community that's helping to shift and change. And I yes. and I felt that that's a really positive. And maybe that's a kind of the taking action versus versus activism type of um, differentiation that that you do. Use. Yes, I, I find that. Yes, really if I could just comment on that briefly because yeah. I think that's so helpful. I think it's a great frame. Uh, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and the action in geographic community is to deal with our growing vulnerability, to, to take adaptation seriously uh, where we live. And the more of us doing that at scale in more and more places, the more it starts to join up and point in the same direction. That, that is an, a, a crucial set of examples. That practivism is a crucial set of examples of what I'm calling uh, uh, the moderate flank. Um, and to go back to what we said at the start of this conversation, there is no doubt but that there will be a rise in um, standard forms of activism during the 2020s. But my claim is that that alone is not enough. What we need, need also is a much larger number of people willing to engage in practivism, willing to engage in forms of taking action on climate and ecology, where they live, in their workplaces, etc. We need that much larger cohort to stand, if you will, in, in the wake of uh, the radical flank, because now that Greta and XR have raised consciousness in the way that they have, that opportunity needs to be fully exploited. And, you know, there are many, many millions of people who are wanting to get involved now, who are wanting to do stuff. Only some of those people will be willing to step up and join something like XR or the School mm -hmm. Strikes for Climate or whatever. Um, many of them will not be willing or not able to, to do that. It's those people and there are so many of them. I'm certain of that now. I know and opinion polls say so. It's those people who we need to get involved in various forms of practivism and of taking action. Yeah. And I and I feel like there's something that that's where the, the power is in terms of where the change lies. And there's a, a, a word that we use, I think I mentioned it before, is myceliation. And yes. I sort of thought, oh, well, I have to speak up to the to those in power in order to get the change. I and then I keep having this flip of thinking and realizing that actually when we connect up and myceliate the communities of change that are happening everywhere from the refugee settlements in East Africa to the indigenous communities in Australia to the to the youth in New York when we start to connect and feel the the power of this change and the possibilities that that presents something happens inside something happens in our yes. communities and yeah, there's yeah. a real power there and so that's yeah. kind of where I've been paying attention to and, and tending to and, and applying compost to kind of that world. And, and, I, and I know that, you know, and trying to connect too with those who are reaching to positions of power and, and I think it's mm. not an either or, it's an and. It's like it's no, the activist. It's a whole joined up, it's a whole joined up ecosystem, right? So, and this is one of the reasons why I use this term moderate flank. So Extinction Rebellion was self-consciously set up as a radical flank and at the exact same moment, amazingly, the school strikes for climate emerged under the model and leadership of uh, of, uh, of Greta, um, and the radical flank to some extent worked. I mean, this is very rare, you know, that, that activist movements really work. The there was a real Greta effect. There was a real XR effect. It it had um, different elements and different compositions and different strengths in different parts of the world but it's been felt in most parts of the world and in some parts of the world, certainly in Australasia and uh, in the UK, uh, it's been felt very, very strongly. Now, what we need to do is to maximally take advantage of that, to exploit that new space that's been opened up, right? Um, 
And we need to do so in a way that complements it. So you've got the radical flank and then you're running along behind it, as it were, in its wake, you've got the, the moderate flank. It's all part of one thing in a certain sense. But in another sense, there are many people who are taking moderate flank style action, who are engaging in practivism, uh, community uh, action, engaging in action in their workplaces, who wouldn't want to be too closely associated with Extinction Rebels or whatever. And that's fine too. So we, we can be in sort of separate places, but still moving in the same direction. And as you say, something which is really exciting about the moderate flank agenda and the kind of myceliation that you're talking about is there is a certain sense, and I talk about this in my recent essay in Perspectiva uh, on the moderate flank, there is a certain sense in which the moderate flank approach is actually more radical than the radical flank. And that sense is that rather than central to what we're doing, being asking those in power to make a change, we are simply starting to enact and model that change uh, ourselves. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who are hungry for that, people who have kind of given up on the existing system or who are just tired or who just wanted to do something positive themselves. That's where their energy is. There's an awful lot of people who are really up now for that kind of ground up positive way of moving forward. So sometimes when I use the term moderate flank, people in the radical flank say to me, well, I don't want to be a moderate. I want to be radical. And I say to them, OK, well, that's fine. You maybe carry on doing what you're doing or maybe you consider the possibility that there really are ways in which this agenda for a truly mass, truly joined up, distributed, ground up, positive movement, um, maybe there's a certain sense in which that's even more radical still. Mm, that's very exciting. I love, yeah, I'm really um, excited to share that and really take that out into the permaculture rebellion conversations. But the conversation that I'd like to to share something with from from uh, from here today is mm -hmm. about our Australian federal election. Considering how poorly um, how poorly behaved our politicians are and how poorly mm. ranked we are globally with our climate action, um, we have an opportunity to do something now politically. Yes. Um, would you have a message to share with Australian voters? Do you think of <laughs> <laughs> Some, I would something, love to. something to uh, to share with them. I think that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if they'll want to listen, and I don't want to kind of you know be uh, be too uh, um, prying in the affairs of another country. But on the other hand, this is a global crisis, uh, and what starts in Australia doesn't end in Australia. I mean, Australia is a climate pariah. Uh, there's there's no other way of putting it. Australia is right at the at the at the bottom been absolutely disastrous for the world for the future for nature not just in australia but all over the planet so yeah the whole world you know needs and deserves frankly to take an interest uh in this uh, election uh and i just really hope that because there was great hope for this last time and it didn't happen i really hope that this time this is the one this is the the climate election because we're not going to get many more opportunities folks we're really not we are so out of time we are busting through 1.5 degrees. We are highly vulnerable. We're in the we're in the age of consequences. It's about adaptation now, at least as much as it's about uh, mitigation. As I say, that's be real transformative uh, adaptation. So, if I were an Australian right now, I would be thinking about the the closest that we have to a worldwide political party. I'd be thinking about the Green Party, in other words. And of course, you have Green Party representation in uh, both your Houses of Parliament. There should be so much more. And you have the alternative vote in Australia. So there isn't really any excuse for not giving your vote to the people you want to give it to. And you can always put Labour or whoever further down the, uh, the ticket for if the Green Party candidate gets knocked out. So I hope there'll be a, a huge upsurge in green votes at this election. I'm also quite encouraged by the rise of the climate independence in Australia. I think that's a really exciting, encouraging phenomenon, quite savvy. Uh, and there's a number of places, again, where it's clear that people should be giving them their first or at least their second uh, preference. But really, you know, give your first preference to who you believe in, for goodness sake. Give your first preference to the Greens. Give your first preference to the climate independence uh, and put whoever um, is your sort of fallback lower down at second, third or fourth on your preferences. Uh, one other thing I would say is... Um, 
the Juice Media, I'm sure that many um, viewers and uh, listeners are aware of the Juice Media, who are based in uh, in Australia, of course. Um, and their um, their um, honest government ads are absolutely devastating, and are loved the world over. Um, I'm a patron of theirs. Uh, Greta's been on the show. Um, I think now is a brilliant time to flog them for all they're worth. In other words, to share, share, share them through your social media. And if anyone watches one of those honest government ads, there is just no way they can carry on giving their vote to Scott Morrison. And they need to be thinking instead of uh, giving their their first, pre- first preference, as I say, to someone who would really do enough. Because, you know, at this point, we need so much more than just uh, 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 labor. You know, we need politicians who actually get it. So, which is why I come back to the Greens and the climate uh, independence. And lastly of all, I would say, whatever happens in the election, bear in mind that that is not going to be enough. You know, even if you've got loads more Greens and, and climate independence and they had a sort of coalition government with labor or something, it's still not going to be enough. It's not going to actually be where we need to be. So, Politics is crucial. Politics is really important. Huge electoral opportunity right now in Australia. It's of interest to the whole world, which is why I don't make too many apologies about answering your question saying, yeah, as a non-Australian, here's the kind of thing I would urge you to think about. Um, But there's so much more than electoral politics. After election day, people need to be carrying on with the permaculture rebellion, carrying on with the practivism, the moderate flank work, etc., because we are in, um, if it's an emergency, it's like no other emergency has been before. It's essentially a permanent emergency. It's the new normal. Uh, and it's it's abnormal in the sense that it's not stable. Um, we're not entering into a new kind of stable um, state of, uh, of normality or abnormality. The situation is going to carry on changing indefinitely. That, again, is why we need transformative adaptation. I hope that's a, a helpful answer to your question. Thank you. That's very very powerful answer and I hope anyone who's listening to this um, will will follow that advice definitely. There was one share, last thing share, I want to Yes, 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 yes. There was one last thing I want to ask you because when the last election was happening, I was actually in the UK and I was I was happened to be in Westminster at the very moment that the climate declaration was um, oh, yes. being discussed and agreed mm. upon. And you were part of that. I understand. So yeah. since, and I came back to Australia thinking, great, Britain's done this, Australia's got to do it, and then everything just kind of fell apart over here. What has happened in the UK since that? Is mm. that climate declaration movement something that has has worked? Do you think that's something that we um, need to be continuing to to push and, and ask our governments to be doing? Mm. It's a great question. I'm afraid my answer is not as encouraging as it might be. So let's let's start off by going back to 2018, 2019, which is when you're talking about. It was a really exciting gambit when the Green Party and then Extinction Rebellion launched this idea of climate, environment, emergency declarations. And yeah, I was a part of the XR team that uh, met with um, government in the UK at the end of the incredible April 2019 Extinction Rebellion. And that was instrumental in getting our government to go along with a parliamentary declaration of uh, climate and environment emergency. This declaration was purely symbolic, right? And that's the first thing to sort of be aware of. And in that sense, it didn't amount to what Extinction Rebellion was asking for, which were emergency declarations, which would actually have teeth, like the emergency declarations that we've seen in some places around uh, COVID, for example which have had various kinds of teeth in terms of allowing government to to do stuff on the back of them. So that's the first point. More generally, as I was implying a minute ago, there's something very weird about this as an emergency. It's essentially permanent. Um, It doesn't kind of feel like an emergency, which makes it very difficult. Um, So I've actually been arguing recently in uh, a piece that's appeared in uh, Emerge, the What is Emerging uh, website, that there's something misleading about this push for um, emergency declarations, and that it hasn't kind of worked out in the way that we had hoped it would, and that that's actually not too surprising. What we actually need, wait for it, it's even a bigger transformation than um, uh, declaring a state of emergency, because of course what we actually need is a whole new paradigm, right? What we actually need is a kind of full spectrum 
economic, social, political, philosophical, spiritual shift uh, in how we live and what we regard as being important. There's a way in which the idea of emergency sort of undersells it, because when you think of an emergency, you think of, well, we tackle this emergency, and then after that, we can go back to something like normal. And as I was saying a minute ago, that just isn't how it's going to be. This is a permanent um, shift and a permanent state of uh, adaptation and of and of, of kind of nimbleness and responsiveness, which we are in or, or need to be uh, in. So on the one hand, I think that these emergency declarations achieved a lot at the time in consciousness, in consciousness raising. On the other hand, I don't think they're really particularly where it's at going forward. I mean, yes, we need to get people to understand that the unprecedented nature of our situation demands unprecedented responses, of course, including from politicians who wouldn't normally go along with those responses. So, so forward thinking or deep thinking conservative politicians, for example, ought to be thinking, well, you know, this is a bit like a war situation, especially now with, you know, the oil fed uh, Putin actually having initiated a war. Um, this is a bit like a war situation. Uh, we need to be um, going beyond politics as usual to think about um, uh, how we undertake um, policy changes uh, which really rise to the spirit of the time in the same kind of way as, for example, we had food rationing in the Second World War. And a food rationing, hugely egalitarian sort of socialist policy, basically. But it was brought in by, by governments such as the UK government, which were led by conservatives, mm. because they understood the nature of the crisis and that it was, in that sense, a sort of, well, emergency. In this situation, whether the term emergency works or not, yes, we need that kind of really radical outside the box thinking people need to step outside their comfort zones. We need to move beyond, as XR puts it, puts it we need to move beyond normal party politics. We need to move beyond um, conventional ideologies. But really, in the final analysis, the shift that we need, and I think permaculturalists will understand this well, is a, a deeper shift, um, a shift that has spiritual dimensions. It's about what kind of people and planet we want to be and are willing to, to be and whether we're actually really serious uh, about survival. So I come back to the, the permaculture rebellion, to practivism, to the, to the growing huge upsurge, which I'm calling the moderate flank, and, and the thought that actually we need to be pushing politicians to do the right thing in all sorts of ways and to step outside their comfort zones. But ultimately, we need to understand that, that it's unlikely that more than a very small minority of politicians are going to get it enough, at least for quite a while to come. Uh, and that means, actually, we need to step to a frame, ultimately, which is even bigger than the emergency frame. We need to shift to a whole new paradigm, a whole new civilization. And to come back to the very start of our conversation, the real question facing us is, are we going to do that deliberately and intentionally and collectively, or is it going to be forced upon us? Because this shift is going to happen. This civilization is coming to an end. The question is whether it ends by way of us transforming it or by way of nature viciously biting us back. Mm. So this idea of, of um, not focusing on heading towards dystopia and not painting a utopia, there's this, I think it's a term that you came up with or someone came up with it inspired by you, but through topia, we need to be yeah. thinking about what does that look like? I mean, is there a name for this new civilization? If we can start to name it, maybe we could start to imagine our way into it and live into mm. it. I mean, have you, is there a name that you've been starting well, to use? People are talking about regeneration, which uh, I think is helpful and obviously goes along very nicely with the permaculture uh, mindset and also, of course, fits very beautifully with the sense in which um, one of the reasons why Extinction Rebellion was such a success in as far as, in as, far as it was a success uh, is because its actions were perceived as so hugely regenerative and, and prefigurative. Uh, and you know, anyone who's taken part in an XR action will probably tell you, if you haven't, dear listener, that uh, it's uh, the, the kind of sense of kind of community and excitement and, and potentiality and energization that what people have been getting from those kind of actions is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, so regeneration for a number of reasons is a helpful term, I think. But, you know, I think the true answer is no, we don't actually have um, 
a concept yet for this uh, new civilization that we're that we are heading towards. Um, and we, of course, don't actually know yet whether we're heading towards a, a utopia or some kind of um, really genuinely desirable future. But yeah, my view is very strongly that it's implausible that we're heading to a utop utopia in the conventional sense. The future isn't going to be uh, all kind of brilliant and beautiful with, with bells on. Um, the future is either going to be terrible or it's going to be kind of okay slash good by way of us kind of facing up to the terribleness and, and getting determined to, to become as good and as flourishing as possible. And that is why I coined this term, which yeah, I did coin, Thrutopia. That is, I think, what we really need now. We really need now to have a sense of where are we trying to head? What's the process? What's the process? It's not so much about destination. It's about the process. We don't know what the destination is, and we can't know that. We don't have power over that. But we do have some power over how we're trying to get there, over the process, over the here and now, over getting through what's coming and in the process, creating as beautiful a future uh, as we can. So I actually think that that's all that we need, really. Um, put aside the question of whether we're going to end up in an out-and-out -out dystopia. Um, put aside the fantasies of, of utopia. Uh, put aside the desire to know where we're heading and focus on doing as being as strong a part and effort as you can be of us getting through what's coming in as positive a way as we can. That's what Thrutopia means. I think we need, we badly need more artistic visions of that, more popular culture visions of that. And what we badly need is people starting to co-create it on the ground. And of course that is happening. We need much more of that. We need it at scale. The, the, the hope, the aspiration for a Thrutopia is something which is achievable uh, if we are willing to throw ourselves into it and make this thing happen at scale. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you so much for being with me today, um, sharing. And I think ending on that conversation around Thrutopia, I think, is a really powerful place to, to wrap up and send people off with. And, and I, I think, is there anything that you can ref, um, refer people to find out more about Thrutopia and, and other works that you're, you're currently focusing on? Oh, sure. So on Thrutopia, you might look at the, the Thrutopia website from the, uh, the Writers Project, which is uh, which has taken off under this heading, which is really, really positive. Uh, Amanda Scott has organised that. Uh, if you want to read the original Thrutopia piece, um, you can find it easily. It's on the Huffington Post um, in 2017 uh, by myself. Uh, and if people are interested in following up on more of the things I've been naming uh, during this conversation, then most of them you can find in one way or another on my website, which is rupertreed.net. Okay, great. I'll put them all down in the show notes for the listeners to, to follow through on. So thank mm. you again so much for um, spending this time out of your um, retreat in France to talk with me today. Um, I hope that's, I hope that's, um, and are you there for much longer in France? Or are you Not much longer now. We've been here for nearly a month. So it's been quite a, a wonderful uh, deep dive and yeah we're ready to go forth now and uh, uh, take these uh, ideas for an eco-spiritual future and growing the moderate flank and so on to take them into the world so watch this space more yes indeed well thank you again thank you so much thank you morag it's been great so thanks everyone for tuning in to this episode of sense making in a changing world I'm delighted to have been able to share my conversation here with Rupert Reed with you. Remember, check out the show notes below for more links, leave us a lovely review and subscribe so you receive notification of our weekly podcast episodes. Thanks again to our organisation, the Permaculture Education Institute for supporting this show, and I wish you all the very best. <music>